ceased to exist. Strangler is yet another episode that was lost until the show's sci-fi run, but this time it feels like a concept episode that was pushed out to fill the schedule. <laughs> One of the first things you'll notice is that the episode has an almost unfinished quality to some of the shots. Merlin, for example, is just a woman standing around in a white robe. The second thing that you'll notice is that the A-plot of the episode could take place basically any time after the pilot. Most of the events of the previous episodes are ignored. We join Caleb and Merlin, who are talking to one another again, I guess. The last time they had a scene together was in Learning to Crawl in which Merle was willing to let Caleb enter the afterlife for good. Merle is upset that Caleb is unable to forgive their father for hurting her, so I guess that's a thing again. She's worried his resentment will fester and he'll turn toward the dark side. Sheriff Buck appears out of nowhere for a verbal sparring session. He threatens to finish the job he started in the pilot, but he finds he can't touch her because she's incorporeal. She uses the powers of mystical whiteout to send him flying, and he vows to get her somehow. Everything about this scene is just... off. Lucas and Merlin behave towards each other like the events of everything since Rebirth never happened. Lucas seems shocked by her powers, and their dialogue seems plucked from another script and repurposed for this scene. I don't suppose you'd find it in your heart to forgive me now, would you? No. You don't deserve it. Since Lucas can't touch her, he kneels in the graveyard and performs an incantation to bring forth the One. Outside of the last episode in which Lucas performed the palmetto whammy on Selena, this is the first time that we've witnessed him actively using magic. As he explained in the previous episode, he never does anything. Things just sort of happen. I kind of like this change for Lucas putting more effort into the supernatural. The spell resurrects the spirit of Albert DeSalvo, the real-life Boston Strangler, played here by Gareth Williams. Defended by future O.J. Simpson attorney F. Lee Bailey, DeSalvo was convicted of raping and strangling 13 women in and around Boston. His case was the basis for two movies in the 1960s, The Strangler, starring Victor Buono, and The Boston Strangler, starring Tony Curtis. The real-life DeSalvo would escape confinement only to turn himself in a few days later, claiming that his escape attempt was to draw attention to the shoddy conditions in his hospital. After being captured a second time, DeSalvo recanted his confession to the murders. In 1971, Texas State Representative Tom Moore decided to prank his fellow legislators and prove that they don't read what's in the bills that they vote on by officially honoring DeSalvo for his role in unconventional techniques involving population control. The bill was approved unanimously. In 1973, DeSalvo was found stabbed to death in the infirmary for, get this, undercutting the prison cartel's sale price for amphetamines. Hey, you can rape and murder as many women as you want, but we will not tolerate the introduction of market forces into the clink. Since DeSalvo was stabbed to death, I guess that makes him eligible for the Merle Lucas Super Bowl draft. As Lucas and Albert discuss it though, Albert was killed for being a celebrity. Lucas does seem a little starstruck by the famous killer, which is also somewhat out of character for him. DeSalvo explains that when the dead kill the dead, they just cease to be. So he's actually the perfect guy to kill Merlin. Again. This premise is simultaneously the best and worst that they ever did. DeSalvo gets a job as a janitor at the local hospital, and we see him creepily leering at all the young women. One of them is Nurse Sarah, who we last saw in Dr. Death Takes a Holiday. Caleb is also there, getting help with his biology paper. The next day, DeSalvo cons his way past Caleb and gets into the Holt house by pretending to be a refrigerator repairman. When Caleb isn't looking, though, he slices one of the hoses, so he'll have a reason to come back. Sheriff Buck stops by the station just long enough to coerce a confession out of a tough perp, and then it's on to the state sheriff's convention where he just might win Sheriff of the Year. The gist of all this is that Deputy Ben is in charge now. That night, DeSalvo strangles Nurse Sarah in her home, and now Deputy Floyd is in a panic as he wants to wait for Lucas. Deputy Ben asserts his authority, though. Caleb shares his gross biology reading with Merlin and says he's afraid of death and sickness. Merle tells Caleb that it's nice where she is, but she does fear the concept of nothingness. Gail tricks Ben into revealing that Nurse Sarah was strangled, 
He slips up with an insulting comment about Lucas being more willing to give her the inside scoop, so she slaps him and walks away. Wouldn't you know it, Miss Holt's refrigerator is still on the fritz and needs repairing. So DeSalvo returns. This time he uses the opportunity to bond with Caleb over their dead sisters. Caleb says if he sees Merle again, he'll put in a good word for old Albert DeSalvo and see if she can't find his sister tooling around the afterlife. Gail interrupts and warns Caleb not to be letting strangers into the house, especially not ones named Albert DeSalvo. Later that night, DeSalvo tries to gain entry into her house, but when she's too suspicious for that, he just uses his ghostly powers to appear. Gail fights him off just long enough for Ben to make the save, but DeSalvo is gone. Nice moment as Gail is explaining what happened and Floyd tries to brush her off as crazy, and Ben goes off on him, demanding that he apologize. Now you apologize. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Miss Emery. I'm sorry, Miss Emery. That's good allyship. There's another great little scene a little later where Floyd questions Ben's ability to do the job by wondering what Lucas would do in this situation. You extort lunch money out of some poor bastard that he caught jaywalking. Hey, no lies detected. DeSalvo lures Caleb to the hospital to get him to call Merlin, but she uses her flashbang power on him and disappears. Albert satisfies his bloodlust by strangling a nurse instead. That night, DeSalvo shows up at the boarding house and attacks Caleb, drawing out Merlin. Put that down. Now. Merlin is willing to sacrifice herself this time, but Caleb summons some of his own demon power and incinerates DeSalvo right then and there. Merle laments the use of demon force to save her because she says it will destroy Caleb eventually. At the station, Ben is settled into his leadership role, just in time for Sheriff of the Year Lucas Buck to return and revert to the normal, lazy, corrupt small town status quo. And we're out! Yeah, this one's not canon. I'm calling it right now. Strangler is an interesting concept episode, a show that you would pin as a what if to show how the characters fit together in their roles, but it doesn't belong to the grander narrative. It's basically the American Gothic holiday special. That said, it works best right where it is in the guide. Most 20 plus episode series will have one episode as a lull right before the big season finale. Sometimes this is a comedy episode or an alternate reality episode if you're watching science fiction, anything to just cleanse the palate. The use of real life Boston Strangler Albert DeSalvo as a character here is of questionable taste, given that it was only about 25 years since his conviction. Many of his victims were still in the prime of life when the episode aired. I'm not sure why you wouldn't just use someone like Jack the Ripper or H.H. Holmes, serial killers who were long dead. Holmes would have made particularly good sense here since psycho scribe Robert Block had already pinned a fictionalized portrayal of Holmes in a book appropriately titled American Gothic. But hey, that's Monday morning quarterbacking. I'm assuming this was also based on notes from the studio. Serial killer films were booming at the time in the wake of Silence of the Lambs, Copycat and Seven being chief among them, it's The Boston Strangler, and Chris Carter's Millennium focusing on serial killers for its first season. Gareth Williams does a fine job as DeSalvo, affecting a believable Southie accent. I gotta be in Nashville by morning. I don't think I've ever heard DeSalvo speak, but I imagine this is what he'd sound like. Could be better. Could be worse. As an episode, it's fine. Even if it doesn't fit anywhere or affect anything, it's a self-contained one-off. If you approach it like that, and you're okay with some fast and loose writing of the characters, this is a decent 45 minutes. What I will talk about, because some things are just fascinating to me, is the punchline of Lucas Buck being named Sheriff of the Year by the South Carolina Sheriff's Association. The Sheriff's Association is a real organization that really does name a Sheriff of the Year, and not surprisingly, they did not name Lucas Buck Sheriff of the Year in 1996. The real life Sheriff of the Year was a man named Herman Young, who passed away in 2020. Young was a black man in Fairfield County, South Carolina during segregation, and his best friend was a white man named Red Beasley. Despite segregation, Herman Young was welcomed into Beasley's family like a son. Red eventually got married to a woman named Sandra while Herman became a cop. 
Not long after that, Red Beasley had a stroke, which rendered him unable to speak. Herman could only communicate with Red through Sandra. When Herman was still a rookie, Red died by apparent suicide. His wrist slit and a gunshot wounded the torso. Red's wife Sandra claimed that Red committed suicide, not wanting to live with his paralysis. Herman was suspicious, especially after Sandra seemed to party it up after Red's death. But of course he could never prove anything. Years went by and Herman got a phone call. It was an investigator from Roanoke, Virginia. A woman named Frances Truesdale was suspected of shooting her husband Jerry in the back of their van. Frances, it turned out, was none other than Sandra Beasley. In fact, Sandra had used at least nine aliases over the years. Her story didn't sit right with the investigators in Virginia, and after a two-year murder investigation, she was convicted in the 1990 killing of Jerry Truesdale. That same year, Herman Young was elected sheriff of Fairfield County in South Carolina, finally having the power to reopen the investigation into Red Beasley's death. Finally, in November 1996, a year after this episode was produced, Sandra was found guilty of Beasley's murder, and Herman Young was named Sheriff of the Year by the South Carolina Sheriff's Association. And that is how you tell an interesting story that has nothing to do with the overall narrative. Thank <laughs> you.